example, the postmodernists have hijacked that observation to say that, well, there's no real stability in viewpoint or value. And also that value systems in and of themselves are oppressive and always pit the, the oppressor against the victim. And so should be dispensed with. Well, that's the fundamental claim of postmodernism. Value systems should be dispensed with because they cause oppressor and oppressed. But the problem with that is that without a value system, you have nothing to live for. There's no value in anything. It, it eliminates your responsibility if you don't have a value system, so that's a plus. But without up and down, there's no movement up. There's no motive, for, mo motive force forward. There's nothing positive to push back against the suffering that's intrinsic in life. And, of course, the postmodernists also don't take into account the fact that value hierarchies or, or power structures, for that matter, can be predicated on competence, not just oppression, competence and ability mm -hmm. and skill and talent and beauty and all sorts of things that seem to be intrinsically worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And also that there's a multiplicity of value structures within a, a, a complicated society like ours. So even if you are oppressed by one standard, which is almost certainly to be the case, um, you know, because you're too ugly, or you're too fat, or you're too stupid, or you're, you know, or, or your skin color disadvantages you, or, or you're, you're estranged sexually, or, like, there's an indefinite number of ways that you don't measure up, and that, that society is somehow set against you with a critical eye, but then there's a very large number of games you could play, and just because you're a loser in one of them, or two of them, or ten, doesn't mean you have to be a loser in all, mm -hmm. and the postmodernists don't take that into account, they, they consider the value structure that's the patriarchy and it's universally oppressive and all the victimized people are the same it's like no no they're not it's wrong it's foolish it's it's unidimensional it's low resolution it's pseudo intellectual and it's it's absolutely it dominates it dominates the universities because you can learn it in about a, a week you sound like an intellectual to outsiders and you don't have to do any work any real thinking perfect perfect solution. Uh, so in your speech you spoke about Milo and um, one of the things that you, you compared him to a gesture mm -hmm. and you said that he's a gesture and I suppose in that analogy uh, society is the king whereas the gesture is the only person who could actually be a provocateur and actually say things that the normal public couldn't say around the king. It's a trickster figure architecturally speaking and Carl Jung regarded the trickster as the precursor to the savior. And it's a very complicated idea. Um, what it basically means is that in order to find your genuine voice or even to move the truth forward, you have to be willing to be a fool because you don't know enough really to speak on behalf of the truth. And so by, by even attempting to do so, you're going to put yourself in an awkward position and make mistakes. And so you have to be willing to do that. And so that's really my own position. He's a provocateur, but many of the people who are coming out in support of free speech, let's say, are comedians. Joe Rogan's a good example, you know, and, and I think it's because, and one of the things that's really interesting about comedians is that comedians say what everyone is thinking, but won't say, and that's why people laugh. It's like, uh, what's his name, that Canadian comic who's always making racial jokes. Uh, uh, Russell? Uh, yeah. Russell yeah. so Peters, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to watch him because he goes in front of 60,000 people. It's like a UN, wherever he goes, and every group is waiting to be insulted and just hoping it will happen. So are, are provocateurs now the free speech activists in, let's say, in the public eye? Yeah. Because they're the only ones who actually have not only guts to do it, but they could say stuff and they could almost get away from yeah, well, like serious public scrutiny. Yeah, well, the thing is they also tend to include themselves in the joke. That's the thing about a comedian. You know, he'll say, he won't say, you're stupid. He'll say, we're stupid, and here's how. And then maybe he'll use himself as a classic example. And if it goes, oh, yeah, we really are stupid like that. And, you know, that's, good comedians do that. What's, it's one of the things that's really characteristic of British comedy, because the Brits always, in their comedy, in their satire, they always include themselves in, in the population of those who, being, who are being satirized. The Monty Python troupe was a good example of that, right? They knew perfectly well that they were exactly the kind of upper-class twits that they were always making fun of. And so it's like, here we are, human beings, aren't we foolish and ridiculous like rhinoceroses and penguins, yet we have this capacity to stand up above our foolishness and to view it with a critical eye and to, and to separate ourselves from it at the same time. Yes, I'm an idiot, but maybe the next time I don't have to. Is it, that, that's interesting because intellectuals do not take that approach when they're in their studies, but 
it seems like comedians are the actual ones who are um, because I have way more respect for Milo way more love for Milo than I do for any sort of uh, political activist out there on the left Uh, even on the right you can see it people are afraid to say what they want to say it seems like provocateurs and people like Milo are the ones who actually have the balls (laughs) to actually say what's on their mind you saw that all that that sort of thing very frequently in the 1960s by the comedians of the left because a huge number of Comics can, the comics can mount ideas from across the ideological spectrum. The, the issue is, is that they don't, they don't have to give a damn. It's because a lot of comedians can do the joke. And the, and the more bitter and pointed the joke, often the funnier. The more provoking, the more it moves close to that edge of yeah. forbidden speech, the more funny it is and the more of a relief it is. And so, yeah, so Milo... You know, Milo's a trickster, no doubt about it. He's an archetypal trickster. And that's why people who fight for freedom of speech love him, because, yeah. you know, he's, he's bringing that issue to the forefront. Well, and he's really, he's a really, uh, what would you call it, a very, very unsettling phenomenon, because he, he, he's got, it's so interesting to watch all the right, young right-wing Republicans in the United States embrace like this flamboyantly promiscuous gay guy from Britain and 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 put him up as a hero it's it's yeah. it's unbelievable that he can do that it's it's amazing what he's done. you see it's characteristic of the left to be that way but now it's the right uh, have any comments about like I think it's a roles of reverse is one I think, I think I think I think that it's an indication of the chaos the political chaos that our society is in now is that that what's on the right and what's on the left is no longer self-evident. Everything, everything is turning into its opposite in some sense. And so it's, it's a very chaotic time. And it's, Milo is exactly the kind of figure that you would expect to emerge in a situation like that. You, he's neither fish nor fowl, right? He's this liminal character that exists on the fringes and, 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 and dances out his antics. And he's unbelievably articulate and, and quick and quick-witted and self-deprecating. You know, he's got an egotistical element. He's self-promoting and all of that. Yeah. But, but he's an entertainer, and people who are like who are entertainers are like that, right? They want to stand in front of a crowd. They want to attract attention. And there's there's positives to that. And the positives are the fact that we have entertaining people. And the negatives are well, it can get grandiose, and you can get surrounded by sick fans and sort of disappear down the rabbit hole. But and you know, I think. I, I would not know how to, what to predict about his future. He's playing an extraordinarily dangerous game, but he seems quite tough. So. Do you think that's the, the best fight we have against people, uh, against the left, is people like Milo? Well, humor is a big deal. Humor is a big deal. It breaks time. through. It breaks through the norm. You, you bet. You bet. You bet. And it also means that you don't, if you're humorous, you don't take yourself with the same deadly seriousness, let's say, that that your ideological opponents do. And you know that if you're not handling something with a light touch, then you haven't mastered it completely, you know. And it's certainly something that I've been guilty of, especially over the last few months, because this has had a, you know, it, it had serious implications for my life, and that's made me more serious about it than, and less able to take it lightly than, than I should be able to because I should be able to sort of dance above it in some sense. So, uh, Last question. Are you optimistic of the future of free speech in the Western world? And I say Western world because this is a problem that's occurring yeah. in all Western countries, I think. Well, I would say, I, I wouldn't say that I'm optimistic or pessimistic. I do believe that we're in a period of, of archetypal chaos. And anything is possible in a situation like that. And, and small things can be determinant. Well, I can give you an example. So, for example, at that free speech rally that, that was held after I released my videos, students organized that, a student from Hong Kong who was concerned about free speech. Well, you know, there were 